Okay, okay. This is going on page 111 when we're done. So this is about FRQ4, okay, and your strategies for success. Um, one of the good things, or one of the things that's different about pre-cal, which I think is a good thing, um, than the other math exams is that they are very, very specific about what the FRQs are going to look like. Um, so every time you get one of these, an FRQ3, it's going to have that stupid graph that you hate. And if you don't figure out how, to y, how a y-axis works, it's going to be a problem for you every single time. Um, so they're, they're you know, almost cookie cutter-like. But that doesn't mean it's going to be exactly the same. You just kind of know the format and you know kind of what to expect. So this is the breakdown of FRQ4. So your last free response, FRQ4, it does not allow calculators. Okay, we know that. But it will require you to solve equations, simplify expressions using functions learned in units one and two. The FRQs will involve trigonometric, inverse trigonometric, logarithmic, and exponential functions. Okay. Here's a brief overview. They got three parts, A, B, and C. Parts A and B are considered easy, medium difficulty. Part C is hard. You've already figured that out, right? I mean, they're straight up telling you it's going to be hard. Doesn't mean it's, un, you know, impossible, but it's going to be difficult. Um, a, B, a and B each involve two different functions that are two points each. Part C involves one function and is worth two points. So two of the three parts, so two of the three parts will require students to solve. One part is just going to ask you to simplify. Okay, so sometimes you're simplifying, sometimes you're solving. And um, C, even though it's hard, it does not mean don't try it, because I think the one that you had on your actual um, uh, mock exam, it was hard and weird. So you, you didn't recognize that it was um, a quadratic, where the one on the one we did last week that I did make the video of yesterday, by the way, um, going over the four FRQs we did last week, that one was difficult, but it was all just exponent rules. So it wasn't like you didn't know how to, what to do, unless you didn't know your exponent rules. Um, so here are the things you have to know. You have to know your log properties, combining log expressions. You have to know your exponent properties, okay? You learn these first in Algebra 1. Every property that you had to use, you learn it in Algebra 1. You do it again in Algebra 2. You do it again in pre-cal. Your log properties, you learn them in Algebra 2. We do them again in pre-cal. Pre -cal. So really, both of these types of things, I haven't seen any of these that are any more difficult than what you actually see in Algebra 2. Um, know your trig identities. These are new. They don't come as quickly to the forefront of your brain. Know your unit circle. I really think that y'all are pretty good at that overall. Okay, You just have to know how to apply it to the solving the trig equations part. Know how to convert from exponential to log and log to exponential. Again, that's algebra 2, and then we do it again in pre-cal. I don't think any of the ones that we've done is any more difficult than what you would have seen in, in algebra 2. And then know your inverse trig notation, that these mean the same thing. So again, these log properties here, these are the exact same log properties that you learn in Algebra 2, exact same difficulty, okay? If you don't, and I, you know, got to be able to put those together correctly. Exponent properties, there's not even any crazy ones. And I don't understand where the confusion comes in sometimes because I know if I ask you what x squared times x is, you're going to come x to the fifth, which means you know that you add the exponents. So those of you that are taking something like this and still trying to multiply the x and the y, I don't know where that's coming from. I think it's because you're not thinking about what you're doing. You're just randomly doing stuff and not even thinking about what your rules are. So when we multiply, we add the exponents, we divide, we subtract. If you multiply the exponents, that's because you have a power to the power situation right here. Okay. So then the trig identities. Again, I know they don't like pop in your mind quickly just because they're fairly new. Now, I feel like this row you totally know without having to overthink things. And if you don't, I don't know where you've been. I mean, you, you kind of have to know that at this point. Um, the rest, I know it looks just insane and intimidating, but when we first learned it, I showed you how to develop these. Now that you've looked at them more, we're going to look at that again, where really, all you, I'm not even going to count this second row because I feel like you just already know it. It's not even a thing. You have to know this one, and you have to know 
half of this one, basically. I don't really like how this is written. But, um, and if you know those two, you can come up with everything else. So what I'm going to do, because I don't want to take any more class time where you actually are going to work together on things, I'm going to make another video where I go through as slowly as I can. I'm not good at going through things slowly. Um, but I'm going to go through as slowly as I can to show you, if you know these two, how we can get everything else. You can do it once again. Um, so if you have this, you know, and you put it in your ISN, then you have all this blank space you can do that on. Or when you flip it up, you've got the lines underneath it. You can do it there. But the best way to practice this, I think, is getting this and this out of your brain. Like, you have to know it. And then just practice writing out the others. Do it a few times on your own without, like, following anything. And I think you'll get the hang of it. And hopefully it'll also be like, oh, I think I need to do that. And do you have to write them all out every single time? Absolutely not. I'll talk, I'll talk you through that as well. Okay. So I will probably just tack that on to the end of this video so that if anybody missed the first part of this, they have this. So when you go to watch that, you can just kind of fast forward to this part and then I'll start a new page and go through that. Okay. That makes sense. We good. All right. So let's look at how we can remember and come up with these identities that we need to know. All right, so, so how can I, how can I, or how to get needed identities? All right, here are the two that you have to know, non-negotiable. Okay, so we know absolutely have to know these okay this is how you're going to get the rest we have to know that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one we also have to know that sine of alpha plus beta equals the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. Okay, those non-negotiables, you absolutely have to know these. All right, commit those to memory in whatever way you need to commit those to memory. Okay, so this is a Pythagorean identity because it's like the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, and there are three Pythagorean identities and then different forms of each one. So I'm going to write, I'm going to rewrite this three times. So sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. And then sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. One more time. Sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Okay. Now, um, if I needed, let's say that I'm doing a something that has uh, cosecant squared in it. Not just cosecant, but cosecant squared. Then I can think, okay, cosecant, if any of them squared has to do with a Pythagorean identity. Now remember, this is the one that we just we know this. We know this to be true. Sine squared plus co cosine squared equals one. So I can write that down. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start here. I'm gonna say, okay, I need something with cosecants in it. So I know that if I do, actually, let me not underline like that. Um, well, yeah. Oh. Sorry, I'll I'll rewrite it again. I have this. I'm gonna take each one of those, and I know that cosecant is one over sine. So here's my one, right? Here's my one right here. So that means if I put one over sine squared theta, that's going to give me my cosecant, right? And so then I'm going to have cosine squared theta over, also has to be over sine squared theta. And then I'm going to have to do sine squared theta over sine squared theta. Now, I could have done this just by writing it underneath this, but I want to make sure that we keep up with what's happening here. So I have divided each term by sine squared because I want, I was thinking I needed cosecant. And so that means I would want one over sine squared. And let me kind of do this as well. So I keep them separate. All right. 
So from here then, sine squared over sine squared is 1 plus cosine over sine is cotangent, so that's cotangent squared theta, and that's equal to cosecant squared theta. Okay, so there's my second Pythagorean identity. All right, here's my first. Here's the second. And then let's look at the third. Okay, so let's say I had needed something with secant in it or something with tangent in it. I can think two different ways. How do I get secant and how do I get tangent? Well, if I do sine over cosine gives me tangent and one over um, cosine gives me secant. So either way you want to look at that. Um, so I'm going to, this time I'm going to divide them all by cosine. So that means I'll get sine squared theta over cosine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta and that's equal to 1 over cosine squared theta. So then when I simplify that, sine over cosine is tangent squared. Cosine over cosine is 1 and 1 over cosine is secant squared theta. So here's my third one. So you don't necessarily have to like when you get your test, write all three of them down because maybe you don't need all three of them. Maybe you only need the sine and cosine one. You don't need the other ones. But if you do, you can write down sine, sine squared plus cosine squared and then you can get to the other ones that you need. And then also remember that you don't have to rewrite this stuff or write it all down necessarily. But because this is true, then I know that sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cosine squared and that cosine squared theta is 1 minus sine squared theta. Also, when you're doing these, do not forget your argument, whether it needs to be theta or it needs to be um, x or whatever you're using there. So same thing here. This could be, I could make this 1 equals cosecant squared theta minus cotangent squared theta. I could say that cotangent squared theta is equal to cosecant squared theta minus 1. Now, if you just have a way of remembering these other ones, because because I do, but I don't have, this isn't how I create them every time. I just kind of know them. But again, I have known mine much longer than you, so that makes a little bit more sense. But I will tell you how, one way to look at this stuff. Okay, so then 1, and then, so that'd be 1 equals, we could do secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta. And we could say that tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta minus 1. And I feel like the stuff I just wrote in pink, most students don't need to actually write that down. Like you can look at this version of it and tell what would happen, but there's nothing wrong with actually writing it down. So I know that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And then I know for these other two, it's going to be 1, and it doesn't matter if this is tangent squared plus 1 or 1 plus tangent squared. This is usually the order you see them written in because they come from these. But um, so then I know on the other ones that even though when we pair them up and we say like, um, you know, if I have a, that when we talk about the reciprocals, there's only one co in every pair. So like secant goes with cosine. Those are reciprocals of each other. Well, sine and cosine are not reciprocals. So I'm pairing them up. They're not reciprocals of each other. They don't go with each other. Um, so tangent and cotangent are reciprocals, so which means they're not going to go together. So if I have cotangent and cosecant and then tangent and secant, like there's two cos here, not one there. Then you got the one plus the tangent versions equals the other. Like there's other ways to remember them. Whatever works for you is great. But if you're like, I am not going to remember it. Like I, I, my brain does not work that way. Then this is how you can create it from this one non-negotiable that you absolutely have to know. Okay. And then we will, let's look at the other which is this um, sine of alpha plus beta. How are we going to get all the rest of that nonsense from this? And again, that is a non-negotiable. You absolutely have to know it. So let's write down what we know. 
me break this off here. So to get the rest of the stuff, I have to know that sine of alpha plus beta. So sine of alpha, oh no, well, yeah, sine of alpha plus beta. That is equal to, I feel like I'm writing too big again. Y'all bear with me. It's been a rough day. All right. <clears throat> sine of alpha plus beta is equal to the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta minus the cosine cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. Okay? So this one is the one that you have to know. All right, so then let's look at the pattern here. Okay, and I want you to think about the pattern and we've got sine of alpha plus beta, okay? This is a sine, so with sine, we start with sine. That's number one, sine of alpha, sine of alpha. And then sine goes sine, cosine, cosine, sine. Oh, and I, God, I totally messed that up too. Now I'm telling you, it has been a rough day. I'm sorry, let me fix that. That is the non-negotiable. That is what you have to know. Because then what I was about to say was, for sine, since these change in each term, the sign here, the S-I-G-N, does not. So if this is plus, this is plus, okay? All right, which means then, I also need to know, possibly, sine of alpha minus beta. Sine of alpha minus beta. So then I start with this pattern here is the same. This is gonna be sine of alpha times the cosine of beta and then the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. All right, and then since this is minus, this is minus. Sine is the same. Remember sine, S-I-N, is the same sine, S-I-G-N. Sine has the same sine, okay, as whatever we're trying to set it equal to. So then we go to look at cosine of alpha times beta, or I'm sorry, cosine of alpha plus beta. I should have waited till tomorrow to finish this video, but I'm going to finish it now. All right, so then, so I know that sine starts with sine. Cosine starts with cosine, so it's cosine of alpha. But it's not going to be cosine of alpha times sine of beta. It's not going to switch like it does. Cosine is going to be cosine alpha, cosine beta. And then we have sine alpha, sine beta. Okay. Then cosine does not have the same sign. Cosine, the sign changes. So when you get the same two things in a term, you change the sign. So then when we get cosine of alpha minus beta, that's equal to, so again, we do cosine alpha, cosine beta, and then this will be sine alpha sine beta, but then since this is minus here, this is plus. Okay, so from this one right here, knowing this one for sure, we've got these other three, just kind of understanding how the patterns work. Now, the other things that we needed were the double angles. Okay, so instead of sine of alpha plus beta, it would be sine of alpha plus alpha, because alpha plus alpha gives me two alpha. So let's look at this. Let me break this off here. And now we're going to develop sine of, so what I'm, I'm going to find is sine of 2 alpha. Oh, that's what I want to do. Sine of 2 alpha. I can write that as the sine of alpha plus alpha. Right? Alpha plus alpha is 2 alpha. Now I'm going to take this and use this right here. So sine of alpha times cosine of beta. But if these are both alpha here now, this will be sine of alpha times cosine of alpha plus 
cosine of alpha times sine of alpha. All right, so now when I look at this here, these two terms are actually the same because 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. That means then, if I add these two together, that gives me two of them. So sine of 2 alpha or 2 theta or 2x or whatever is equal to 2 sine alpha cosine alpha. So you have a couple of options here. You can create sine of 2 alpha from this, or you can just know what it is. I mean, that's possible. Even if you don't have the great brain to just memorize everything, maybe you just understand this. One thing that will help you with this is to actually rewrite this stuff for yourself. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So now let's find the cosine of the double angles. So I'm going to use this right here and I want cosine of 2 alpha, which would be cosine of alpha plus alpha. Now I'm going to substitute it into this right here. Nope, this right here. Um, so cosine of alpha times cosine of alpha minus sine of alpha times sine of alpha. Well, cosine times cosine is cosine squared, sine times sine is sine squared, so that means that cosine of 2 alpha is equal to cosine squared of alpha minus sine squared alpha. There's actually three forms of this. I think on this other page, there's only one listed. Yeah. So he only lists one, which is fine, and that's enough. So I'm just going to tell you that when you put this in, okay, so if you are going to substitute something, um, I mean, there are easier ways to substitute. Like, I'm going to tell you what the others are. I guess, okay, I'll write them down. Not really going to go through how to figure them out. Maybe I won't even write them down. I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth. I told you all, it's been a day. Um, I'll just tell you what they are. It would be 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha or 2 cosine squared alpha minus 1. And you can get to those by using your Pythagorean identity. So it might be better if you had to substitute something to just go ahead and substitute this and, you know, this right here, and then if you need to, you know what you can substitute in for cosine squared. You can do 1 minus sine squared, and for sine squared, you can substitute in 1 minus cosine squared. Just be very, very careful with these subtraction ones, um, and uh, make sure you use parentheses is all I'm saying here. So with all of that said, um, I am going to, I'm going to finish what, I'm, what I wanted to say about how to practice this stuff. And then I will come back at the end and I'll show you the other two and how to get there. But if you feel like you don't want to watch that part because you don't want to confuse yourself, then just don't watch that part and go with this. Okay. But here's something that's going to help you because, you know, I think, I think y'all are mature enough and understand enough that the way you get better at anything is to practice it. So if you just look at this once and you write it down once and you're like, oh, I can get those now. I don't know how well that's going to work out for you. So let's talk about what a good way is to prepare for this and how we can practice with this. So remember that your non-negotiables, you have to know this and you have to know this. So I would start by doing basically what I did here. Write this down. I need to stop with the big old. Um, like I did here, here, and here. Just get the smaller one. Here, here, and here. And then get to the other ones on your own without looking at anything. And even, even if you don't do these two versions and these two versions, these two versions, at the very least, you already know this one, you got that, you wrote it down, then write it down again and get to here, and write it down again and get to here, okay? And then without looking at anything, write this down, 
because this is your non-negotiable, right? And then after you write it down without looking at anything, double check that you're correct. And then if you're correct, then move on and try to get everything else. And if you need to look at something while you're doing it, you know, just like every now and then check yourself, that's fine. Um, or even just recopying it a few times so that you can get to them. Are you going to have to use every single one of these on the test? No, I highly doubt it, but you don't know which one or two you might actually have to use. So you need to be at least comfortable enough that you can get to that point. Okay. So if you don't want to see how to get to the other two versions of this, then we can be done for now. If you want to see that with parentheses and all, so maybe it's not a bad idea to watch it, um, that is what I'm going to do now. Okay. So I've gotten this one. Let's see. Do it in this color. So if I want another way to say cosine, oh well, that's not another way to do cosine of 2 alpha maybe I shouldn't put that here 2 alpha equals so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace cosine squared now I know from up here that cosine squared is equal to 1 plus oh I'm sorry 1 minus sine squared so where cosine squared is I'm going to do 1 minus sine squared alpha in two, more than one term, so it's in parentheses, minus sine squared alpha. So then that's where I get 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha. So it's not too confusing or anything. You just have to be careful with your parentheses. I can also say that cosine of 2 alpha is equal to, so I'm going to leave the cosine squared this time, minus, and then I know that I can replace sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared. So I'm doing parentheses because it's more than one term. 1 minus cosine squared alpha equals, all right, now cosine squared minus a negative cosine squared is a positive 2 cosine squared alpha, and then minus 1. So really, even if you don't develop this one right here. If you know this one or you can get there, then you can remember if I place this, replace this with a one, then I get two of those. If I replace this with a one, I get two of those. Really just depends on how your brain works and how you can remember things. But this is doable. I mean, if you just look over this, this looks like a hot, intimidating mess. I agree and I understand it 100%. Okay, but you can do this. You can do hard things. You can come up with this. You just have to not psych yourself out, okay? So practice. Practice makes perfect, but we don't have to be perfect, but we can strive for perfection, right? Just got to put in the work.